Hi everyone, Dom Femulara here. I am back for Mapex as we do these live events from players from all around the world. It's so exciting. Today I've got with me Sean Fuller. Sean, thank you so much for, for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Dom, for having me. I appreciate it, man. This is amazing. I love the, I love the fact that we can utilize technology and see each other face to face. It's great. It's pretty amazing when you think about what has happened with this crazy this crazy pandemic that has happened, it has opened up opportunities for many people to have this level of communication at such a high intense level with, even Absolutely. if you're just doing tracks for people and what's happening. So how have you been dealing with this, uh, you know, seclusion from the music industry now? Well, I will tell you at first it was very awkward. It was very odd. I mean, being a, a, a touring musician, like you're used to having a certain amount of time off between usually October and like maybe February, March, that kind of thing. And I was getting excited. I was getting pumped. It was getting around, you know, January. And then we started hearing little tidbits about what was going on. And, and I was like, God, oh, ain't going to, you know, it is what it is going to fizzle. out, like, whatever, you know, you, and you just don't realize the magnitude of what this thing really yeah. did until they go, by the way, uh, we're not touring this year. Uh, so <laughs> when that, when that hit, um, I was scared at first. I was um, confused, frustrated. Um, yeah. at the same time, like, I think it took me about a good four to six weeks to kind of like come to grips with it, um, and say, okay, mm -hmm. well, we're going to be done for a while. Now it's just time for me to focus on things that I haven't had a chance to focus on. Um, in the last seven, eight years, it's been just a freaking onslaught of touring and, you know, that kind of thing. So, and which I'm grateful for, don't get me wrong, but like now it's like, you know, you're stuck at home with your thoughts. <laughs> you're stuck at home with your thoughts. Well and, and you've got your family there and you've got your artistic talent to kind of embellish. So you've got a lot of good things going your way. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I am truly a blessed person. And, and I can tell you right now that uh, I'm not saying that the COVID-19 has been a, a good thing in, in regards to what it's done to a lot of people and how it's affected a lot of people but in in my world like because of the blessings that i that i have in my life i've, I've just been very fortunate to really start to mainstream and focus and compartmentalize the things that I need to get in touch with, which was my kids and my wife and my family and my house and all the good stuff that comes with that. So, yeah. Boy, that, But that's beautiful. Well, let's go back to the beginning now. You know, where you were born, Evansville, Indiana, correct? Evansville, Indiana was where I was born. Absolutely. I, I've been there several times and, and performed at different music stores there many, many years ago. Yeah. So you, you came from a musical family. What What, what was the what was the musical influence in your family when you were young? Well, I, the funny story is my dad was a guitar player, was all of his life. Um, and well, he started, I guess, as a bass player, then became a guitar player. Um, from what I gather, which I'd never seen her play it, I'd never seen her hold it in her hand, but my mother played uh, like saxophone. So my older brother played saxophone. Nice. My oldest sister played uh, flute. And then my youngest sister played clarinet, I do believe. Uh, so we come from different... Uh, different things, I th and I, I, the story goes with my father. Uh, he played in a lot of a lot of bands around town, and and I wondered uh, at the time, or actually, like later in life, if this was a true story. So, and I think that it is, is that uh, basically he couldn't keep a drummer in his band, so he just decided to force me to learn. <laughs> 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 and so he's like, "Well, he's going to live by my rules. He's going to live under my house. He's going to play drums by God." <laughs> <laughs> well, that turned out pretty well, if I say so. It turned people. out extremely well. So I, I'm I'm very fortunate and the drums have been just an absolute blessing in my life and um and it's it's the one thing that i know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if i'm going through something or if i'm feeling something or something emotional is happening to me or whatever i can sew that drum kit and i can work it out you know it's great what an, what an amazing tool that we have that we have at our disposal tell me about what kind of what kind of music were you listening to at that age when you were younger what, what, what was around my dad brought me up on anything from country music to um, to good old fashioned rock and roll, which at the time, um, if you think about what was country and what was rock at the time, I mean, you, you're looking at, I brought up on the Oak Ridge Boys in Alabama, um, and then, you know, uh, uh, Charlie Daniels band, things of that nature at that particular time, as far as country is concerned. Um, but as far as rock and roll, it was ZZ Top, it was, uh, it was the Doobie Brothers. It was Queen. It was Led Zeppelin. It was Black Sabbath. It was, I mean, just an onslaught of just different 
styles, feels, genres, whatever. But the good thing is, it's like it was just a great melting pot and it molded me into somebody that's very advantageous when it comes to being able to play with and sit in with any band because I just, the one thing that I have, like I can't remember my own, what I ate yesterday, but I can remember a million songs. So <laughs> it's craziness. I have a library, it's just crazy. That's the true musician in you. That's how it. That's how it should be for a musician. That's for sure. <laughs> so what? So tell me something. So you're you're playing with 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 the family band. Is that what it was kind of started when you were younger? Well, I, it it wasn't so much that the rest of the the group as it was my dad. My dad played with buddies around town and and that kind of thing. And so at uh, at the ripe old age of about 14, 15 years old, I was playing in bars and clubs with my dad. Right. Um, and of course. You know, my dad at the time would uh, I mean, he's he's over in this corner with the guys having a beer, you know, and I'm over in this corner way over yonder out of everybody's reach having, having some Kool-Aid or some water or whatever it was that because they weren't, you know, what I'm saying like it, at that particular time, like it was. And I'm sure, I'm sure it still is extremely frowned upon to have somebody of my age, underage playing in a bar. But, you know, they didn't they didn't really I guess from where I was standing, you know, they didn't mess with me too much. It was just they let me go play. And and uh, that was kind of my my job, if you will. I mean, I, we grew up around horses and um, all that good stuff. So my my summer jobs were were playing in a band and riding horses and showing horses and things of that nature. So I had both the country and the rock side of me and everything. So <laughs> Boy, that is a, that's a, what a wonderful combination. That really, really is. When did you start taking lessons? Uh, I would say that uh, uh, nine, 10. And that's just from a gentleman named Greg Tooley, yeah. uh, who was, uh, uh, and, and he still teaches in Evansville, Indiana. He started at More Music. I don't know if you, you've been to Evansville. There was a place called More Music. I remember More Music. Absolutely. Okay. Sure, sure. So, so I, I think I might have met Greg at one point years ago. Sure. You, I guarantee you, you did. Um, but More Music actually started uh, in a, 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 a basically out of a radio shack that right. started in uh, Newburgh, Indiana. Uh, and then Greg Tooley would teach me in the downstairs of that radio shack. And then that eventually became more music. Um, so it, it was one of those things where um, I love I hated it at the time, but I love it now. Yeah, yeah. Greg never let me touch a drum set until I learned every rudiment, until I learned it frontwards and backwards at multiple speeds and, and, and just to a to a metronome. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't understand it at the time. Of course, as a kid, you don't, you know, you have a very short uh, attention span. You're like, and you're, he's like, this is a paradiddle. And I'm like going, I wonder what's going on outside. You know? So it's just one of those kind of deals. So I, I, I went back and forth on it where my dad was just like, you know, should we take him out of lessons? Should we keep him in lessons? And then Greg talked me into doing certain things. And then by the time that I had, I don't want to say master the snare drum because I don't know that you ever really master it. But I will say that uh, he had me at a point where sitting out a drum set and doing some of the just basic thing, rock beat one and just going from there, like was so much easier to to tackle as opposed to just not knowing where that's where that comes from. And I actually later in life had students and I started teaching the exact same way and to the to the point where I lost some students because they just the as they as, I guess as generations go a little bit further their attention spans get smaller <laughs> but the ones that hang in there and they and they're just like I get it I want to I want to do this like they're they're killing it they're doing a great job and they're making money of their own now playing doing whatever they want to do so absolutely so was, was there a time when you were taking lessons with 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 uh, with Greg was it were there books that he took you through at all or okay so the the uh, let's. I would start with like stick control, George Lawrence. I would start with uh, progressive steps to syncopation, yeah. um, basic mm -hmm. snare drum methods, uh, Podemsky's snare method book, yeah, um, things of that nature. So we we started in those. Um, and again, like we didn't even look at the books until he would write stuff out a lot of times before he would let me even look at the book. So he would we would go through quarter notes, we would go through quarter rest, eighth notes, sixteenth. I mean, all of the notation, and he would get me equipped before we started. So it's almost like you go so far and then you start over so that you can see what it looks like on paper. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it turned out really, really good. Boy, how, how smart of him to, to really kind of open up the ideas of planting those seeds at such an early stage that I'm sure this has been extremely helpful for you. Yeah. Now, when you oh, 
Well, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know, if I didn't have that knowledge, you know, when, we, when we're working stuff out for the band or for Florida Georgia Line or we're on stage and we're like, hey, let's do some kind of new intro or whatever. It's it's easy. No, it's easier now knowing like when my band leader says, hey, let's do some, you know, let's do this six tuplet thing at the at the intro and yada, 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 yada. like go into this spiel using notation and words of that nature. And somebody who doesn't know that's going to go. Um, <laughs> what's that? You know, and so, you know, I, I again, like all through my life, I've, I've I, I, I guess it was hard for me to understand how certain things came into my life when it when it did. Um, but I will tell you that, like, I'm so grateful now that I, I again, like I don't know the master plan. The master plan knows me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so the, the 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 things that have kind of been incorporated in my life at specific times has helped me become, you know, a uh, not necessarily this this great drummer, but I'm I'm a good drummer and I play with a really good band and a bunch of fun guys. And um, I'm, I'm forever, forever grateful for the things that have been kind of popped into my life when they did. Well, it's pretty powerful when you think about that, that knowledge that was planted to you from from Greg, which is really and it's, it's not old school. It's it's what I call smart school, smart school, there you go. preparing you, you know, with some of these Older books. Stick Control was written in 1935. Yeah. George Lawrence Stone had the vision that here it is, you know, you know, as as students today still go through that book, it still works. Yeah. Yeah. So the process of, of, of learning it was really, really great. So now you're taking lessons, playing with your dad's band, you're doing some things. Mm -hmm. What kind of happened at that point? Um, I, I as I got a little bit like 17, 18, 19 years old. Um of course, dad's band wasn't cutting for me anymore, so I, I needed to join other bands. And of course, uh, you know, at that time, I mean, I'm 49 years old. Uh, and so at that time, you know, we're, we're, we're now we're into the, eight, the, the mid 80s, late 80s, which at that time for me was rock and roll. Heaven. We're talking hair bands. We're talking metal bands. We're talking, yeah, yeah. you know, all of that good stuff. And so I went to every concert I could possibly go to. And I will tell you that. You know, I I had it already in my heart and in my mind that at one day I'm going to be that guy on that stage. It's going to happen. I'm going to force it to happen. I'm not, you know, doing anything else. There's nothing else in my mind that I want to do. Every time I would think, well, maybe I could do this or I could do that. It'd be like, no, I'm going to be a musician. That's going to be me on that stage. How powerful. How powerful that you stuck with that. Who were who were some of your drumming influences and your heroes at that time? You know, what? what's funny is um, depending on what genre or whatever there there's several and i could tell you right now i know that it's it's very cliche um but john bonham <laughs> i mean yeah. uh, you know it's very it's cliche to say neil neil, neil peart you know what i'm saying it's yeah. cliche um to say those kind of names but i will tell you that that those were like some of the big 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 influences on me and and it's not just them but like mm -hmm. what i tell what i tell people to do is like look like if you have an influence OK, that's great. Now do yourself a favor. Now do research on that guy to find out what his influence was and so on and so forth. Because when you do start doing that history of what it is that like drove them to be what they are, that's when you're starting to really learn. You know what I'm saying? You're digging deeper into just not what this guy want or, or learn from this person, but what the person before him did. You know, say so it's generational. Absolutely. Well, you know, listen, John Bonham, I had the chance of meeting one of John Bonham's teachers, Jim Marshall. Awesome. and two of John Bonham's major influences were Buddy Rich and Joe Morello. Yes, absolutely. Diehard jazz players. So mm -hmm. we, we don't think of John Bonham as a jazz player, although he was an excellent jazz drummer. Yeah. And he pulled those ideas and influence. So that's, a, that's great advice to go back. Who else? Were there any other drummers that, that you also you know, enjoyed listening to? Oh my gosh, Bill Bruford. Um, going through that time. I mean, if you're talking like, I mean, the, the, the drummers that like influenced me into, into rock, like rock drumming, solid rock. And because at the time it's also not just about uh, performing the drums. It's also about the performance, the live performance. Yeah, and yeah. so at that point, MTV was a big portion of this. So not, not only did you get to hear what that drummer was playing, but you also got to see what they were like playing. Yeah. And so at the time, you know, there was there was Peter Chris from Kiss. There was yeah. there was Tommy Lee from Motley Crue. There, you know, what I'm saying like all all of these different drummers that came from these different bands. I mean, I I, I to I to this day, anytime I put on any album, like it just it it just takes me back to that time and that era. 
and and I and I can remember what it is that I learned about them from Tommy Lee. It was performance. Yeah. You know what I'm saying he was a solid, so oh, gifted drummer, uh, excellent, you know, excellent player. But his performance is what was over the top. And and honestly, like later in life, I didn't know that that was going to be a portion of what I was doing. I mean, there's a lot of drummers that will play for their respective artists. Um, and, and they're and they're basically told to kind of stay back in the dark and just play pocket. And this is what your job is. And you're going to get a paycheck at it. Well, I did that for the longest time. I've been with uh, you know artists that wanted me to do that. Um, with FGL, it was a different story. They didn't want that. They wanted this larger than life, you know what I'm saying, like performer. And that's where my inner Tommy Lee would come out. You know what I'm saying? And especially in the especially in the early years where, you know, first first couple of years when they hit big, you know, they, they didn't want this tiny little drum set. They wanted something massive. So I I, I, I utilized this first massive kit that I got from Mapex, which uh, was a my identity kit. Uh, and so okay. I, I, it was three bass drums. Uh, two up toms up on top, two floor toms, two snare drums, two high. I mean, just this, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, uh, of stuff. And of course, the, the questions that I always got, which I thought were hilarious, like, how are you playing all three of those bass drums? And I'm like, it's it's smoke and mirrors, folks. <laughs> it's smoke and mirrors. I'm only playing the center one. The other two are just there for looks, but they wanted like this just massive setup, um, which I parlayed into getting me a drum tech because I wasn't about to set up and tear that thing down. It's not going to happen. So I parlayed that into getting me a drum tech, which which was amazing. And and here we go off to the races and 200 plus shows a year, you know? So uh, it was, it was pretty incredible. And I have to say that like, that's you know when 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 uh, when Joe Hibbs when I approached him with this idea, yeah. for this kit and whatnot, he was like, "How many bass drums? And <laughs> you want what?" And 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 he's like, he's like, "We'll figure this out." But I tell you, like he came through once he understood what was happening with FGL and how fast it blew. It wasn't that that they were an overnight success. It just blew up so quick with the song Cruise. Yeah. Um, and once he saw what was happening and he saw the stage set up, he was like, yeah, this warrants three, three bass drums. So <laughs> it's just massive tour. And, and like, I mean, after the first album, we were already headlining, you know what I'm saying? Like we had already bypassed several people that we were opening for six months earlier, yeah. you know? And so it was just an incredible ride right off the top. And, and God bless. I mean, Mapex has been there ever since. If anybody, has seen my drum kits over the tour last, you know, several tours there. I mean, these are ki not only killer looking, but killer sounding, you oh, know. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, I, we got to talk just for a second about Joe Hibbs. Joe Hibbs yeah. is a visionary at many levels. I knew yeah. Joe for well over 40 years. Yeah. A very, very dear friend of mine. We literally spoke on the phone every day, every morning at 6 a.m. Oh, my God. He's Christmas Day, he would call yeah. me at 6 a.m. I mean, every day we talked about ideas and drumming, and he was that kind of person. Yeah. For him to rest in peace, it's been a few a few years since he's passed away, and yeah. we really missed that level of that. But he had a vision where he saw, because we talked about it, he saw yeah. what you were doing. Yeah. You know, FGL was, was really kind of like, you know, on the cutting edge of what was happening in, in the combining of country music of what you were doing with yeah. all and he saw it, and here it is that you know it's it's an, another another adventure in the Joe Hibbs uh, history books, bro. He's he. I will tell you this, Joe. What Joe Hibbs became like? I had met Joe a few years before I was a Mapex artist, but I had I was touring with a couple of different things, but it was not really you know they weren't things that like I was super excited about, and I think he saw that too. So we didn't we didn't connect until the FGL thing, but um, when it came time to talk and about drum companies that I wanted to be with, you know, what I always remember was that one meeting that I took with Joe Hibbs years earlier, yeah. where, where he took me to a Mexican restaurant. We sat and we ate Mexican food, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and, and before he asked anything about drums, he asked about my family. Yeah. He asked about, you know, are you, are you married? What's your family like? You know I mean? We talked about everything but drums for a good solid hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, and that was that when I joined him Apex, that was our relationship from that moment going forward. Everything, anytime that I ever talked to him, it was, how's your family? We talked about family more than we did drums. Uh, anytime that we got together and then, you know, obviously, uh, 
um, when when what happened happened, I was I was very distraught because you know Joe was Joe to me was like a second father. He really really was. Um, he he would talk about anything other. He wouldn't he wasn't worried about the business portion of things. He said we'll get to that. That will always be there. Let's talk about you. Let's how are you doing? How are you feeling? How's your health? I mean anything prior. Uh, you know, to, to to talking about drums, but then then when we talked about drums, it was just an onslaught of just ideas and things that he was thinking about and yada yada, and it was it was super good, man. I, I love that guy to bits, miss him miss him dearly. But what a great way to develop a relationship, which is I think it's so great that a lot of these younger drummers understand that these relationships with these companies are just that yeah. they are relationships about people. Yeah. The product that'll all kind of come later on. That'll all kind of work its way out and uh, yeah. and, and develop. It. Well, that's a, a beautiful story. So now you're playing Mapex. Where did the whole FGL thing, Florida Georgia Line? Where did that whole thing come from? Where, where did it start? How'd you get the contact for it? Okay, so here, so I'll tell you the the story. I'll try to tell you it as quick as I can. Um, I mean, obviously, I've been in Nashville since '97. I didn't. You know, I, the one thing I told myself before I moved to town was that I was not going to put a time limit on my dream, period. Um, and that's one thing that I teach to this day is never put a time limit on your dream. I, I actually went through different artists prior to FGL that got me where I am. And I will tell you right now, I learned the business end of Nashville twice before I got to FGL. Right, right. Uh, but, I, but I did end up going through um, an audition, basically, with them. They had uh, it's my whole my whole story revolves around a domino effect of. Um, different tours that I've been on and the band that's been opening is usually the band that I ended up with. <laughs> um, but, you know, honestly, like I started um, many years ago when Craig Morgan was getting back from uh, Desert Storm, I helped him do a few little Walmart shareholder meeting things and that kind of nature. And then that parlayed itself into helping a, an artist um, that was more of a songwriter than an artist. His name was Shane Miner. Uh, Tracy Broussard, the drummer for uh, Blake Shelton, uh, is the one that got me on that gig. Uh, did that. But how, how'd you meet him? Okay. So, so Tracy at the time I was working at, uh, Sam Ash, believe it or not, it was, uh, just turned Sam Ash when it, before it was thoroughbred music. And so I was working at Sam Ash music, selling drumsticks, drum heads, drums, whatever. Um, and Mapex drums, they were in there too. Uh, so I was selling, uh, basically drum gear to all the pros that would come in because they either at the time were worth new artists and didn't have endorsements or whatever. Um, at the time Tracy was just leaving his, uh, was just leaving Shane Minor to go to a new artist. Um, and that's when me, we had talked many times about kids and families and this, that, and the other. And he said, Hey man, I got this, I got like four shows left with this guy named Shane Minor. Would you want to fill him out? And I was like, uh, yeah, foot in the door right there, foot in the door. And so took that gig, uh, busted my butt, learned the material, went and did that. And then that parlayed itself into other stuff. And then um, a friend of mine that moved from Evansville a couple of years prior to me was working downtown on Music Row at a studio um, as just a kind of a go for guy. He's actually a, a very accomplished engineer now. But back then he was just kind of a gopher uh, nice. at a studio. And uh, he would basically um, when songwriters could not afford the daytime studio times, they would come in after hours. And then my guy uh, would come in and he would engineer for him. So he would call me in to do studio stuff with these songwriters uh, for basically pizza and beer at the time. I mean, we weren't. But to me, it was a foot in the door. It was an opportunity. I saw that yeah. as an opportunity. Yeah. Um, and so I did all of that. So I, I, I've got drum demos on some of the bigger names and in, in songwritings just as demo stuff that turned out to be big hits later on. Um, so I did that. And, so, and that, is, was that around the time with um Hillary Lindsay and and yeah. and Dallas Davis, Dallas and, Davis and, and those guys, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, both yeah. major hit, major hit songwriters. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, I did that. I remember cutting a demo one night, late night demo, and I was going to come in the next morning because I had time to to tear down the drums and get them out of the studio people's way so that they could do sessions. Came in, was tearing my drum set down, and then walks a guy named Luke Bryan, uh, who at the time was just a songwriter from Murrah Publishing, and and. Uh, but him and my him and my guy were roommates. Little did I know. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, at the time, Luke was on the. I remember this to a T. Luke was on the phone. He was mad as mad as can be because his drummer had bailed on him for the weekend of shows, and my my guy Brian uh, Brian basically said, "Hey, my buddy Sean here plays drums. Would you be interested in using him?" And so at the time, Luke was like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, I'll get his number. Maybe I'll call him, whatever." So he took my number. And he was getting ready to walk. He goes, "Ah, screw it. You're hired." So he hired me without even hearing me play. <laughs> so I went and played with him. And then lo and behold, that went into three to four years of playing with Luke Bryan. 
as soon as he got his deal with uh, Capitol Records, I actually left to go do a rock project thing that looked promising. And we were out with like Nonpoint, Hinder, Saliva, Dark New Day, Power Man 5000, just bands of that era, you know? Wow. And uh, uh, needless to say, my thing started fizzling. I didn't, it wasn't going anywhere. There was, there was some things happening there but so so did luke's drummer so uh, at the time i basically went back played with luke for a while and then we ended up on tour uh with justin moore as the opening act ended up playing with justin for a few years and lo and behold we ended up doing this thing uh like i said seven or eight years ago playing this thing called the cmt throwdown tour uh and it was uh, uh gary allen was the headline act uh, Justin Moore was the, the the supporting act, and then off on this side stage, way way over here was Florida Georgia Line. Uh, this girl named Maggie Rose and a couple of other different bands that hadn't done anything yet, but they were on like up and comers, if you will. Uh, so I did like a handful of shows there with Justin as the main act uh, with with Gary Allen, and I didn't know this at the time, but FGL uh, was coming in to watch me. Every show that we did, they were watching me play with Justin. So they had they had envious eyes, I say. Uh, but what, but, no, but what, what kind of setup did you have at that time when they came here? What kind of setup did you have? Was it a smaller setup, bigger setup? It was it was just, you know what, like I still like sizable kits, but it, this for, for this kind of thing, it was still just a one up, two down, you know what I'm saying? Uh, kick drum, two snare drums. But I think what they were loving was it wasn't so much the size of the kit as it was what I was doing behind it. And right. so, you know, at the time, uh, the artist that I was playing for, he also thought he wanted someone <laughs> that was back there giving it everything. Yeah. Um, but it turned out that like, you know, management, I guess, kind of didn't like the fact that I was putting on a show back there. So uh, yeah. needless, needless to say, it wasn't too long after that, that I was getting phone calls from FGL. Uh, and I had to ask, I had to ask that question, like, what kind of drummer are you looking for? What do you want? I can give you either one. I give you whatever it is that you want, but I need to know personally before I get involved yeah. what it is that you want. And so, uh, you know, they had uh, they had given a call. Um, I remember this to a I was outside working in the yard. They gave me a call and it was their manager. And I answered the phone. And they said, uh, hey, this is so and so with Florida Georgia Line. And, and uh, we'd like to offer you, you know, a chance to go out on, on tour with with FGO and blah, blah, blah. And at the time, like, I'll be honest with you, I was in a little bit of a haze, not knowing if I wanted to tour anymore. Um, and so I actually turned down the initial audition offer. Uh, and so they they, uh, they call me back about an hour later and they said, we really like for you at least to audition. So I was like, OK, well, send me the material and I'll see if I like it. I hadn't heard the song Crude yet. <laughs> I had no idea. The The only thing that got me to take that audition, there was a, um, a, a girl at the time staying at mine and my wife's house. Uh, she had just moved to town. We were helping her out. And she knew more about what was happening with that group than I did because I had gone on the phone and she said, who was that? And I said, it was this manager from this group letting me audition. And she goes, what was the name of the band? She said, I said, Florida Georgia Line. And she goes, you're an idiot. Did you just turn down that off? And so Needless to say, you know, <laughs> I took the audition. Um, funny story behind that audition is I was, again, working out in the yard. And prior to that audition, uh, I thought I was a lumberjack. I was up in a tree cutting a limb down from a tree and fell out of the tree, oh. broke my rib um, and still took the audition, still got the gig. And the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great that you like to do that kind of work around the house. Hopefully, you're a little bit more careful now in what you're doing. In, in yeah, I, I may look like a lumberjack, but I'm not a lumberjack. <laughs> so you do the audition, you get the gig. So now you, 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 they're going to get ready to go hit the road now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this was, I mean, it was go. I mean, it was go time. So I had um, learned three or four songs of theirs for the audition that they wanted me to learn. Um, and there's, and so they said, we'd like to hire, they did this over a breakfast. We went to this breakfast place and they said, we want to hire you. Um, we're leaving in five days. <laughs> and I was like five days. And they're like, yeah, we're going to hit a bunch of tin roofs and things of that nature. We want, we want you, uh, ready to go in five days. And so between that breakfast and that fifth day of leaving, we're talking chart man right here. Now I'm charting everything out. I'm woodshedding. I'm doing the best that I can. And not only did they have their material, but the time they had to fulfill contractual time. So 
they had an album's worth of material, but they had to play 90 minutes. And so there was also 30 minutes of cover songs that they wanted me to learn and or or back history stuff that uh, some of the true fans of FGL will remember uh, that didn't make necessarily the the out the first album, yeah. if you will. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we had to learn a bunch of stuff. And so we're in a sprinter van with a trailer and we're it's go, baby. Like we're we're hitting the hitting the road and I'm in the they're just charting away and listening to songs and like air drumming and trying to figure out the parts and whatnot and all that craziness. So the skill of being able to transcribe the music, yes. and the drum parts. this is a very important part that a lot of young drummers don't necessarily have the skill of reading or understanding some of the reading. Yeah. But thank God that you had that going back. So it was like, you're in the van, you're transcribing, you're writing out measures, you're writing out fills, you're writing out kicks, you're writing out, you know, leering. Listen, between the A section, the B section, you probably put in certain lyrics in his codes. What was it like? Man, I tell you, um, so I, I do uh, the, the uh, what is it? The uh, Nashville number system. So yeah. I utilize the Nashville number system for the most part. If there's, especially with like FGL stuff, or well, actually for anything, to be honest with you, like if there's, if there's something that's really defining, uh, uh, i.e. a fill that sounds like a stab of a band or the bands are doing stabs. Well, I will actually write it out to make sure that like I'm playing what the band is used to hearing or what they're comfortable of playing. Um, obviously, I'll write out the kind of groove it is and I'll, I'll basically just write out a bar of what that groove is for each individual section because most of the stuff, it doesn't change. It mm -hmm. stays the same pretty much throughout the verse or throughout the course or the bridge or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll use all of that notate. I'll use I'll, kind of a concoction of the national number system and notation, util utilizing things that I learned in notation like repeat signs and codas and things of that nature uh, to, to get through this and, and make sure that it's at least at eyes view. I try to learn it prior. Usually by the time that I've charted it out, I've already learned it it's already up here for the most part, but I'll keep it there as kind of a, a safety net, if you will, in case I need to like revert to it just real quickly. Right. Where did you learn the Nashville number system from? Uh, Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had to learn it really quick. It's funny. Um, I took, uh, so Eddie Bears is a good friend and Eddie's, Eddie's uh, great. Uh, Isn't Eddie fantastic? Eddie is amazing. Um, and so, you know, uh, obviously he was part of that. There's a book here, the, the Nashville number system that he had some charts in um, that I, you know, actually utilized prior to meeting him. Um, and then we met um, basically, oh gosh, I forget who it was he was playing at the time, but there was a big massive festival and he was playing for this. I want to say it was a, a female artist during the daytime. We were playing later in the evening, but I had to go watch him play just because I'm just a big fan. And mm -hmm. uh, especially of all of his accomplishments and recordings and things of that nature. So, you know, I went and introduced myself and we talked for a good while. Then we ended up having, like he'd come back and we'd have conversations at Cracker Barrels and things of that nature. And, um, and then we met up again. He's a, he's one of the house drummers at the Grand Ole Opry now. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I, uh, any any time that he sees either FGL doing something there or if I'm playing there, I'll try to look him up and say, hey, I'll see you here shortly. And of course, you know, we always try to hang out for a few minutes prior. And uh, what what a just a, an amazing guy and talent uh, of his own regard, you know. Well, he, he really is. He's also a great keyboard player. He does some yeah. playing keyboard. So, I mean, yeah. Ed, you know, a musical director. He's phenomenal. I actually just spoke to him last week. And if you get a chance, there's an interview that I did with Eddie on the Sessions panel which okay. is a YouTube channel that, that uh, I'm a part of. It's the Sessions is plural, Sessions panel. Okay. Get a chance, go there and watch my interview with Eddie Bayer. Okay. He, 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 he unleashed things about his life that was so important to understand. Yeah. That I constantly recommend that interview for just someone who wants to be inspired by somebody who has got the incredible experience yeah. and depth that Eddie has. Oh, it's, 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 it's absolutely astronomical. That, that guy has... Uh, and his performances and his recordings and everything that he has done, like he is just a, just a, he is he is the he is what everybody should be looking up to to be yeah. in this industry. Yeah, no doubt, he is absolutely the standard, and he's and he, and and every time he does something, he raises the bar. So he's a, 
one to kind of catch up to because he's so good at what he does. <laughs> I, well, I used to I used to sneak out and uh, go see him with the players uh, yeah. when they would perform in Nashville. Uh, and and with well, the 12th and Porter, I think they played quite a bit here in Nashville. Um, but I would go sneak out and watch him and the perform and, and the players play. And and it was every time it was just like watching. I was like, God, just that feel and that pocket and that you know what I'm saying. And and then he would just pull out some what I call arsenal. Just yeah. something, something that you're just like going, oh, I didn't know he could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie was the uh, musical director for a, uh, an event that we did in Nashville in honoring of Hal Blaine. Oh, Hal Blaine, yeah. who, uh, you know, rest his soul, passed away last year. Yeah. But uh, we were able to honor Hal Blaine. And we had several different drummers performing several different tunes that Hal played on. Yeah. And I was one of the drummers to play a tune that Hal played on in front of Hal Blaine. And Eddie was the musical director. So here yeah. I'm sitting there going, my guys, I've got Hal Blaine in the audience. I've got Eddie here. It was just so great. Liv DeVita was there. So many great, great drummers went there to honor Hal. But Eddie was just the absolute consummate pro at all levels of organizing this. Oh gosh, absolutely! Like I, I'm again, like I, the, you know, like the, I can tell you that, like in 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 the experiences that I have had, like I can, there is not a day that goes by that I sh that I should ever grumble about anything that I have ever done. I do. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But then I then I look at everything that I have that been been put in place to accomplish and who I have met and the people that have inspired me and the people that have put me in certain areas and and it never stops. Um, as of recent here, another rock drummer that was a just a huge influence of me is now in Nashville. He, well, I guess he's been here for a little while now, but his name is Troy Lucetta, Um, and he's the drummer for a band called Tesla. And Troy is a dear friend of mine, oh and he was with me years ago, and I was just with him when they were on Long Island. But Tesla, the fact that you're there with Troy, please send him my best. Another great person to listen to. Amazing drummer. Like I, I just knew him from Tesla stuff. I didn't know about the orchestral stuff that he had recorded. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he played it for me, and I'm like, "You're in, that's incredible. Like yeah. you're, you're, you're a master. That's awesome. So, so yeah, I mean, he's a dear friend and, and he, you know, he is definitely somebody now that like if I'm going through anything or, or that I need to talk to you, like he such a spiritual guide, you know, yeah. and so him and his wife, both his they're just amazing people in their own right. So I, I got to give credit where credit's to. Well, that's really fantastic. You know, Troy, interesting enough, first of all, what he's done for the Tesla laboratory here on Long Island. Oh, wow. Long Island is where Tesla's laboratory was back in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And Troy, in helping refurbish it, got involved. Of course, that's why they named the band after Tesla, yeah. Nikola Tesla. The statue that was delivered from Yugoslavia, the old Yugoslavia president came by and delivered the statue, and Troy was there. Troy is like at the cusp of all this stuff. And he came to Long Island to perform. I went to hear the band. We mm -hmm. got together, and we met at the Tesla laboratory. I took a tour there, Troy and I. Yeah. A brilliant, brilliant guy. But if you get a chance, on the sessions panel, I also interviewed Troy Lucetta. Go check out that interview. I'm just wondering why you haven't interviewed me, Fong. I'm just saying, like, you know, you got all these other great drummers. Well, okay, now I say great drummers now, so I understand now why I'm not on there. But anyway, I'm just when I get back down to Nashville, you're on the list again. When we can start traveling again and we can get back to Nashville, when we got down there many, many, many years ago, and now with the traveling, we've, we've kind of put things on store for sure. Absolutely. Right, right, right. Well, I, I tell you what, like I said, these these are these are people that I am so fortunate to like. They're just in my phone. I can call at any moment oh, and, just say, and just say, hey, how are you? You know, what I'm saying like I haven't talked to you in a while. Give me a shout, you know, or go have breakfast or whatever it is. Like they know where I live. I mean, it's it's, it's these are like. I can't tell you like how many times I've gone over to Troy's house and and I'll, and he'll he'll tell you this too, but his touring kit from I want to say it was a year or two ago. Yeah. Um, we I had gone over to his house and it was the first time I'd ever been to his house, which amazed by all the stuff that he has. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I go out to his drumming building. Yeah, he has multiple buildings. I went out to his drumming building <laughs> and uh, he goes, "Yeah, man, go out there and like." look at the drums and like, you know, I'm not married to anything. Just have fun with the stuff or whatever. So I go out there and I, I build this kit based off of my knowledge of Tesla albums nice. and things, things that like I have done either, either through uh, uh, Edison's medicine, you know, psychotic supper and yeah. things, all those albums that they have, that they mechanical resonance, whatever, all these albums that they had recorded. And I was sitting there thinking to myself while I'm building this kit, well, if I was doing, 
Freedom Slaves, this one of their songs, Freedom Slaves. I would want this really deep snare drum over here. So, so I'm building this kit based off of the material of songs that I know. Yeah. And then Troy comes out like an hour later and he's looking at his all, all this, this massive setup that I have built. Huh. It's like, what did you do? And I and I showed him because he didn't know how big of a fan I was at Tesla at the time. That's great. So I showed him, I was like, well, if I was playing Freedom Slaves, I'd want this snare drum because you got that marching snare thing at the beginning, you know, and if I'm doing this, I, I would want that over here, these extra toms or, you know, that kind of thing. He goes, you weren't lying. You're a you're a true fan, aren't you? Like, I told you, I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not a crazy fan. I'm just a true fan. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, so he ended up keeping that kit and then he had Ario Speedwagon's drum tech yeah. come out and build a rack around it. And he just kept it. Like he changed, like he maneuvered a couple of things to fit his self, but he kept that kit and toured with that. And I was, I was so honored. I was like, are you kidding me? Like I just having fun out in your, building and you, you, <laughs> and you utilize that kit so but it's great that you've done this kind of research into these players uh, you know yeah. and it, it's truly a, a testimonial showing to your to your dedication of what you're doing that these people want to have you in their phone book because they want to connect with you because you're really honest and sincere at what yeah. you're doing this is huge thank you so much i appreciate that really, really uh, i mean and, and and just the fact that let, let's go back down so with fgl the touring now has paused yeah. The intense touring you were doing up to this was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I would say for the first, uh, like I said, I've been with them eight years now, yeah. seven, eight years. Uh, the first three to three or four years, it was over 200 shows a year. Mm -hmm. And that's with sometimes multiple shows a day. I remember specific times where we would be, um, we would be in LA setting up for a show later that evening, get done with our sound check drop sticks, drop guitars, things of that nature, get on a private jet, fly to San Diego, go do like a Nickelodeon thing. Mm -hmm. Literally right after we get done playing, drop those sticks, get back on the plane, fly back to LA just in time to walk on stage to do a show. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just, it was pandemonium at that time. I'm not saying it was Beatlesque. It was never that, but I will say that like there were times we were going, this is crazy. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, shuttle vans and award shows and you know, all those cool things that like, as a kid, you're, you know, you watch these things on television and, and you're yeah. thinking to yourself, man, how cool would it be to be doing that? And now I'm doing that. And now I'm just like, holy cow, this is crazy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know when you think about it, listen, FGL, these guys, 11 times platinum breakout cruise, Grammy nominated duo history since 2012, first to achieve the RIAA's diamond certification, 10 million sold. Yeah, I mean, the, the longest reign in Billboard 50 weeks. I mean, this is incredible. The number one meant to say honored by the ACM, the AMA, the Billboard, CMA, CMT Music Awards. I mean, there's some serious momentum. I in know. The group. And they and they have yet to begin. I mean, they'll tell you that. Like it, they're they're up for a Grammy now. Um, yeah. And I and I do believe that uh, um, they've got big things in the future. One one thing that our guys do is they they. They they take the time to relax and rest, but they don't let grass grow under their feet. Mm. They, they're ready for the next thing. They don't they don't want to think about what the song they put out yesterday. They want to think about the song they're getting ready to put out. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And so you know it's 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 always a creative aspect with them. I love the fact that they <clears throat> that they cross genre. You know what I'm saying? That they that they songwrite with other songwriters from different genres, i.e. Nelly, i.e. the Backstreet Boys, uh, BB Rexa, uh, the Chainsmokers, things of that, things of that nature, uh, like bands and artists that are just huge that that they get the opportunity to go back and forth and write with. Um, and, and so it's, it's always interesting. You know, not only do they have accolades in country music, but they have accolades in pop and in, in all these other things, you know, what I'm saying like yeah. one of the first songs that they that they put out that was a was actually a cover song um, was uh, 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 the song Stay. And that was actually by a band called Blackstone Cherry. Um, and so they did their version of that. And that was another hit, you know, and it's funny, like I talked to the 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 uh, um, singer and the drummer uh from blackstone cherry now and and they're and every time i see them like i'm not the one that did it but they're just like hey man we really appreciate you guys putting that song back out there on the radio and and uh and i was like man i love playing that song and he goes well i don't know if you love playing or not. He goes but it sure did take care of that new house <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's always it's always fun catching I up with it. fans and whatnot. So it's a blast. I love it. So now, so, so the band's off. Yeah. We're sitting down. We're all kind of in 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 pause mode right now. <laughs> Yeah. You know, do you have are there any other things that you're working on right now? Man, I tell you what, I've been very fortunate. Like, like again, because this happened, um, I, I it actually kind of cornered me into like really learning how to do some some in home recording stuff. Uh, and I don't have necessarily the professional professional setup and yada yada, but I do have. Uh, an electronic set that I have a kind of immersed myself in for right now until I can build my studio, much like what you're doing yeah. and, or actually did, I'm, I'm getting ready to do that. But, uh, uh, so I've kind of built, got myself built into learning how to record and like learning how to really harness, um, MIDI files and, and, you know, sending people stems and things of that nature for their own stuff. Uh, and so pe people have reached out to me and said, Hey man, I got this song. You want to, can you record on it? And Absolutely. You know, so they send it to me, I record on it. I send it back to them. So everything is done through Dropbox or we transfer or one of those transferring files kind of deal. Um, and I'm working on my own project in between that. So, which is a, a something that I that I've longed to do for many years. But I've been so busy with Florida Georgia Line. I've been so busy with so many different other things, including being a father. Um, that this time off now, it just kind of hit me and dawned on me like this is a great opportunity to start that. And I didn't really know who it was that I wanted to do it with until. I'd say probably a few months ago, uh, a, a dear friend of mine is an amazing bass player named Josh Paul, who's the the bassist for Daughtry. Um, we kind of had a little talk at a at this this backstage thing that we were doing here in Nashville called Rare Hair. It's just a a cover tune thing where everybody gets up in the makeshift bands and we play cover songs like hair band songs and things of that nature. Super fun, but. He played on a couple of stuff. Well, then we ended up meeting up at a uh, a charity event uh, through charity bomb or through charity charity bomb, I believe it was. Um, and it was me and him on bass and the Pop Off Brothers, who were the uh, the guitar player and the lead singer from the band Lit. And so we we collaborated, talked about this, and it was like, man, how cool would it be to do his his my his mindset was in the exact same thing as mine. It's like I really want to do something that I can say I did. This was me. This was my thing, and put it out there and see yeah. what people think. And I was like, bro, you've got the same dream as me. Let's do this. And he's an amazing bassist. So um, me and him are going to uh, we, we chatted about it. And then for the longest time, I was looking for a guitar player. And I had this guitar player under my nose the whole time. Nobody really knows us, but knows him. Um, he hasn't done a lot of touring. He's just an incredible guitar player. Um, and his name is Johnny Cotton. And so us us three have formed a little three piece deal here and so we're each got like little in-home studios and we're doing some recording we're passing around files and seeing where it goes we haven't included a lyricist or a singer yet because we want to get the musical portion down first uh, and then try to figure that out um we do we, we've kind of him hauled around a couple of names which i'm not going to say right now <laughs> but i will tell you that if you give me the opportunity to join you again here in a few months we will actually have a name and we will do going. that for sure we'll do that for <laughs> sure. but it's so exciting that you're still Listen, motivated to make this happen. And, you know, it's the balance, Sean, of this, this intense skill that we're trying to keep our artistic skill at a higher level. Then yes. there's the business side of still maintaining business calls with FGL, et cetera. Then yeah. there's the family, the balance of your just your home life. The yeah. balance of all of that is really what, where the real skill comes into making this whole thing well, fly. It, it does. And I will tell you that, like, you know, the, the old adage is correct. You know, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I and I follow that. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of my, my my creed, if you will. Like if I if I'm loving what I'm doing, I'm not working. If I feel like it's work, it's probably time to, you know, either, you know, reflect on that or, <laughs> you know, figure, oh. figure that out, you know. Uh, but I'm, again, like I'm very, very fortunate. And, you know, Florida Georgia Line has given me a platform to meet an incredible immense amount of, of really, really cool people. And I've done more in this group than I've ever done in my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, I've accomplished more than I've ever done in my entire life through my guys in this group. Um, and I've learned so much, not, not just business wise, but musically speaking, like just, just knowing that, that my name's not on that ticket and that like what this, what has to fit has to fit musically, not, not so much what I want to play, but so much what needs to be played. You know what I'm saying? So, um, there's, there's a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, uh, learning that happened through this that like I'm, I'm forever grateful for. And so now I get to utilize that in my projects and the things that I do, it all comes to play. You know what I'm saying? It all works out. 
How great. It, it really, really, it's fantastic what you're doing and the, and this forward motion that you're involved with. This is all good stuff for sure. <laughs> Amen to that. Amen to that. Well, and, I will, and I will tell you that I will continue to use this platform for anything good that I can do. Every, and if anybody knows me, they know that I do speaking events. I go to, uh, uh, I've got an event called Faith Goals Life. Uh, so if you get a chance, and you should go check it out too. It's www.faithgoalslife.com. Go check that out. I but I'm also going to schools and I'm going to rock out for some people and I utilize some tracks and we have fun. Troy's got a similar program, but he's his, when I say similar, it's, it's kind of the same basis, but he has a different message. Um, and so, you know, we, we both actually talked about maybe collaborating and, and doing some things right. together. Um, so there's, there's those, I know Liberty was it Liberty DeVito has stuff. I mean, there, everybody has like that kind of thing. I, to me, it's, you know, having kids has really put this into focus for me to to utilize this platform to help hopefully bring them up and get get some of those kids that are like going through some things out of that, out of whatever that is, and, and hopefully focus them to something that's really, really cool and let them know that dreams actually do come true. Well, that is, that's just so beautiful. Now, so it's faith comes live. It's faith goals and life. But if you go to it, yeah, faith, if you go life. to it, it's just faithgoalslife.com. Well, that's so fantastic. You know, we've had tons of people that have joined us here. James Harrison, Bill Justice, Bob Terry, another yeah. phenomenal drummer and, and, and great help to all of the, the drummers that have been out there. Uh, Greg Tooley, Renato, ah. Renato Costa from Portugal. I mean, you've got some people from all around the world. You've even got, got Arthur from uh, from Ufa, Russia, that has joined oh us. Oh my here. goodness! My God, I'm, I'm I am what ZZ Top would call nationwide. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, worldwide, I guess it would be. <laughs> yeah, now it's international. So tell me about Mapex drums. What, what, what drums are you playing now? Oh my gosh! Uh, so I have been I have been like I said, the first setup that I went with was the Mydentity because I feel like with that I had a lot of options to bring um, something kind of crazy cool to what the FGO thing was. Yeah. Um, since then, I jumped on the Saturn V kits. Uh, which I truly love. My God, I, I can't tell you. Like one of the things that my my drum tech has always told me, and 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 I will relay this right here is is that through all of that touring, that which is a ton, we've never had like I and I don't think we've ever had anything break down. Nothing. It, it's so it's. I don't want to say it's indestructible, but I'm telling you right now, I put a beating on it. You know what I'm saying? And many shows uh, on those kits and, and never had any issues with them, never had any troubles. They always come out of the case sounding good. Minor yeah. tuning adjustments here and there. And that's about it. Never had any complaints from, uh, you know, sound guys or this, that and the other. They, you know, it, it's they say that they they're just easy to EQ. They're really easy to take care of. And, and they just sound good coming out of the box. Um, yeah. Been playing the Saturn V kits for the longest time. And, um, you know, some of the some of the snare drums that I that I utilize um, de definitely they're hammered snare drums de like machete things of that nature. Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the snare drums I have right here that I actually believe it or not. Uh, Let's see what you have there. Look at that guy right there. Boy, that talk about that, baby. That's Russ Miller at his best, man. Talk about that. I'm going to pull myself out of it so it goes to a wider screen. Just yeah. talk about that drum for a second, Sean. Okay, so so yeah, this is the Forsades. Uh, snare drum, and it is uh, uh, one of Russ Miller's like finest. Just it, it's just an incredible snare drum. Not only does it look gorgeous, um, it comes with that fiber skin head on it, and a, a nice, beautiful picture of Russ as well. Um, and I'll tell you that the, the just the amount of sound that comes from this this snare drum is incredible. Um, I will tell you that like I've used it for brushwork. Um, I've used it for some very poppy stuff. I've used it for some uh, uh, just kind of laid back pocket kind of things, that kind of nature. And it sounds incredible. I don't have to do anything to it. I actually love the fiber skin head on it because it just I don't I don't know what it, it just makes that drum sing. And I think Russ had that in mind when he put it on it. Um, and so why change something that a, that a master like Russ would put on there? So I haven't changed it. It's been on there. Um, but, uh, That's great. I'm just saying it's an incredible snare drum. It's one of probably 10 that I have, you know, and and again, what a blessing to be with Mapex that like will just they're like they trust you to like have these drums and utilize them because they know uh, that you're doing, you're doing them justice. And I will tell you that like, I'm a big fan, like that it's very seldom that I get a shallow snare drum. Anybody at Mapex will tell you that I love deep snare drums. I love eight inch deep snare drums. And so uh, they're Black Panther snare drums, uh, eight inch deep one. Oh my God. The uh, Fat Bob. I mean, I mean, come on now. All those snare drums are just incredible. And they're coming out with a, or they just did come out with a ton more snare drums that I'm super excited about. 
I saw them all at the recent NAMM show in January, which just was a six months ago, which seems like it was 100 years ago because of all this crazy pandemic stuff. But the drums that have come out now are absolutely fantastic. Another gentleman, I'm going to bring a question up here. Another okay. gentleman, James Harrison, who also owns and is into many, many snare drums yeah. and what he does. His question is, with all the overdub sequence part loops, etc., how do you identify what you actually have to play with listening to certain tunes? How do you oh. pull all the parts out? Okay, so so um, anybody that's ever like what we utilize, and, and this is a, a very known program called Ableton. Um, and so basically, what happens is, is we from the from the album, we will pull those stems of those different parts so that we can obviously use them live and give them different channels so that we can control them live. Right. That being said, at that point, what I do when I'm listening to the song is I'm pulling out just two parts because I keep a couple of trigger drums on the kit. I pull out two parts. Um, I pull out something that might emulate a snare drum or something that might emulate a bass drum. OK, so like, there might be a verse that like breaks down to this cool something of that nature. I don't want Ableton to play that part. I don't want to sit there with my twiddling my thumbs waiting for my part to come up to play live. I find those parts. I take those samples and I put them into those uh, pads and I play those live. I don't ever want to be not busy behind the drum kit. I don't want to look like I'm just sitting there like, you know, this while everybody else is having a good time. I want to play the parts. So I find those parts, pull the samples out, uh, put them in the uh, just like a like a row in SPDSX or something of that nature. Trigger them out, put two triggers, one on either side of me and I play those parts. Yeah, and, then, and honestly, like if you ever go to an FTL video and you hear uh, like a verse come down where it doesn't sound like an acoustic kit playing, but you hear this loop playing. Yeah. Look at what I'm doing back there. <laughs> that, 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 I parts, yeah. That is really fantastic. You know, it's amazing, Sean, to see that you're 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 pushing it forward. FGL is stronger than ever. When that gets back on the road and touring, when this world gets back to some kind of a momentum, you'll be back out in the road again doing it. So it'll be exciting to see when that happens. I will. I will tell you that, like, we just did a Zoom meeting with the band uh, just a few days ago, and. Everybody is just like, I mean, if, if we weren't, you could not get more excited to be on tour than this band is right now. Like we're pulling out all the stops. I know that, uh, you know, we, we have uh, rescheduled all the Kenny Chesney dates. So all of those are going to be stadium dates. We're talking right. 50,000 people or more. So they're going to be incredible. I'm so stoked to be playing uh, with Kenny in there. And Sean Paddock's a good friend, but great yeah. drummer, great drummer. So I, I mean, again, I'm still a kid in a candy store. Anytime, <laughs> I, go, anytime I go to a tour where we're, we haven't opened for somebody in years. And so like this is the kid in the candy store coming out again in me where I get to go watch Sean Paddock play, who's an incredible drummer and, and just learn. Like to me, it's not about watching. I, you know, I'll, I'm sure I'll look around or whatever. But like Paddock is the one I'm going to be watching just to see what he does. You never stop learning at this instrument and you should never stop doing that. But the last time I got to do that was when I watched the Charlie Daniels band play and I got to see Pat play. And Pat's just an amazing drummer. So uh, it was it, to me, those those these are all educational. <laughs> Well, it's great that you see it that way. That's actually a great way to close in what you're saying. So to, to keep on learning, to keep on pushing yourself, mm -hmm. and to keep that childlike enthusiasm alive, which you still have. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm almost 50 years old, and I will tell you that like, I feel I feel like I can run a – well, I probably can't run a marathon. I'll probably throw it at you or something. I'm just saying that I feel like I could run a marathon. I'm ready to get back on the road. Let's do another 200 shows, man. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to happen sooner than we think. It'll be exciting to get you on the road and, and get back into action. Sean, I must thank, thank you so much for your time. You know, Maypix allows us to have this, this vehicle of being able to reach people around the world through yeah. their Facebook page. Yes. And eventually this will go on to Mapex's YouTube channel. So I tell everybody, go there and subscribe to the Mapex YouTube channel. Go by and watch that. The interview will be will be up for anyone that, that possibly missed it. But uh, Sean, I thank you so much. Good, good luck in your travels to yourself and to your family, man. Keep me posted on what you're doing, and we'll touch base real soon. Thanks so much. Truly, truly my pleasure. Thank you so much, Tom. God bless. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye -bye.